Thank you, Dr. Baycoat. It is a pleasure to be with you this day. Good hospitality, good conversation, and um, even the snow is uh, relevant. We, the, I, I live on the East Coast where we've had record numbers of snow. Um, I've had three consecutive engagements canceled because I got snowed in, and I just want to make sure that I can get out of here in the morning. Um, <laughs> because I have all my classes at Howard University to teach tomorrow. And uh, we've already been snowed out a lot on the East Coast. Though I, I, I did see somebody, um, somebody from Chicago News was on. They basically said that um, those of us on the East Coast are really chumps, that um, you guys get snow all the time and you deal with it. And when we get into New York, we cry. Um, so um, I'm. I'm, I'm optimistic that I will be able to get out of here since you all are so hardy. And um, we'll have all the streets plowed and, you know, a, an SUV to take me to the airport, whatever it is you guys do out here, um, <laughs> as long as I can get to school tomorrow. Uh, I, I titled my uh, lecture tonight, If Anybody Ask You Who I Am, uh, The Church and Mass Incarceration. And that phrase, if anybody asks you who I am, comes from a 1993 gospel song by Chicago, the late Chicago gospel songwriter, uh, Jesse Dixon. And the chorus says, if anybody asks you who I am, just tell them that I am redeemed. The song speaks of the miracle of Christian conversion. The singer details the transition from a person of hate and malfeasance to one of love and virtue. It assumes some prior recognition of the ways in which the now believer was once a person of ill repute and reputation. Therefore, inquiries concerning the person's character and identity would ensue. If anybody asks you just who I am, says the singer, tell them I am redeemed. The chorus goes like this. I am redeemed, bought with a price. Jesus has changed my whole life. If anybody asks you just who I am, tell them I am redeemed. Why rehearse this gospel classic for a discussion about the church and mass incarceration? Is this a call to simple evangelism within the jails and prisons of our nation? Is this a rallying cry to preach the gospel to the two million Americans who populate the correctional institutions of this nation who, as noted last week by Dr. Michael Leo Owens, who did the inaugural lecture, for the uh, Center for Urban Engagement, has the highest rate of incarceration in the so-called developed world. Is this a press for more prison money from our churches and parachurch organizations? No, my reason for selecting this song as a frame for our discussion is this affirmation of two concepts rooted in theological anthropology. And I, when I wrote this, I did not know that Dr. Baycoat taught the theological anthropology class here, so I, I hope this is okay. I'm just, you know, okay, okay, we're still on the website, um, <laughs> so, you know, we, oh, like, okay, so, you know, it's just, no, see, I don't want to be like the guy, right, there's this guy, that I know I'm coming off paper, but I, you know, the, this guy that, 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 that survived the Johnstown flood, you remember the Johnstown flood, big event in American history, and that was his big thing, he's always bragged he'd survive the Johnstown flood, he'd go to the barber shop, he'd tell everybody he'd survive the Johnstown flood, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd go to church and testify, and I had survived the Johnstown flood. And, and, and when he died and he got to heaven, he went to St. Peter and he says, um, I want you to get everybody together so I can tell them how I survived the Johnstown flood. And he thought that was a strange request, but he decided, well, why not? We'll humor him. So he got all the saints together and put the guy up to talk about how he survived the Johnstown flood, except just before he, he spoke, Peter said to him, just remember, Noah's in the audience. So, you know. So this is a theological anthropology argument. And theological anthropology, you know, is, is how we define humanity from a theological perspective. And the two elements of theological anthropology that impact the way in which we do criminal justice, or the way in which we don't do criminal justice, are the Imago Dei and human relationality. Humanity created in the image of God and humanity created for other human beings. We were not created to function as lone rangers. We were, function, we were created to function in, in 
in community, just as the Trinity is a community, what we call the internal economy of the Godhead, just as the Trinity is, is a community, we were created to be in relationship with each other. Theological anthropology, or rather a lack thereof, looms as a primary reason for our failure as people of faith to undertake meaningful engagement in the criminal justice system, whether through the delivery of services, which, by which I basically mean prison ministry, going to visit people in the prison, the kind of, kind of traditional things we do in providing the service, religious services that is called in the criminal justice system, or whether it's through advocacy for systemic change, reform in the plethora of justice institutions where policies impede the advancement of people of color differently than their white counterparts, incarcerates them at disproportionate rates to white America, and places badges of shame and stigma upon all involved that last long beyond the period of incarceration itself. In the latter case, the fact that we still call people ex-offenders years after they've returned home from prison indicates our unwillingness to remove the shame and stigma from their time of incarceration and continue to define them in light of the worst time of their life. If an inmate or an incarcerated person were to ask you, who am I? If anybody asks you who I am, what would you say? Would you call them a convict? Would you call them a predator? Would you call them an inmate? Would you call them an animal? Would you call them a thug? Or would you call them a person? Doubtful. Definitely not someone created in the image of God. Our cultural narrative does not support the Imago Dei for those who are behind bars. And certainly not someone of worth. In fact, the gospel singer says, I've been redeemed, bought with a price. You only pay a price for something that's worth something or for someone who's worth something. So if Jesus died for the inmate, then the inmate is worth something. If Jesus died for the person in prison, it means that they were valuable in spite of their behavior. If Jesus died for them, they are bought with a price. So who is the inmate? This concept clearly applies to the incarcerated. The inmate is worth dying for. The other place where the Imago Dei becomes confused is in the racialization of our system of incarceration. Punishment has been racialized in this country. There are some who argue that more blacks than whites, more browns than whites, proportionately go to prison because their behavior reflects criminal behavior when the truth is that their neighborhoods are policed differently, the truth is that their stereotypes lead to different practices with regard to sentencing. And indeed, the fact of the matter is that we know, especially since most of the, most of the increase in crime rates is due to drug laws, we know that statistically, people of color are no more active in drug use than white people. If I were to ask today, how many of you don't know where to get drugs? I doubt if any of you would raise your hand, unless you were trying to prove to the other folks that you're super saved. <laughs> Notice I'm not saying that you use them. I'm not asking anybody if you use drugs. But white people know where to find them. They know where they are, they know who sells them. It's just that their neighborhoods are policed. Your neighborhoods don't have stop and frisk laws. Your neighborhoods are policed differently. Policemen take you home when you're an adolescent, when they take inner city young people to jail when they're adolescents. It's a difference in policing policy and it is deliberate and it is systemic. If you read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, you will see where she quotes Chief White House Counsel John Ehrlichman on the strategy that he and Richard Nixon and others employed in order to win the 1968 election. It's a quote directly from John Ehrlichman, Richard Nixon's chief counsel. Look, we understood we couldn't make it illegal to be young or poor or black in the United States, but we could criminalize their common pleasure. We understood that drugs were not the health problem we were making them out to be, 
but it was such a perfect issue that we couldn't resist it. H.R. Haldeman, another Nixon aide and architect of the 1968 presidential campaign. Quote, Nixon emphasized that you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to. That's the birth of the war on drugs. Not concern for mental health, physical health, really not even concern for public safety, but a non-racialized strategy that deliberately targeted a particular population in the wake of the gains of the civil rights era designed to win Southern Democrats over into the Republican Party, hence the so-called Southern Strategy of 1968, which culminated in the election of Nixon, the culmination of the war on drugs, which was really a war on the poor, the black, the brown, and the young. What we have developed then is a system that dehumanizes young black males rather than sees them in the eyes of God, or in the image of God rather. Strategies for policing and incarceration disproportionately shine a light on their behavior as criminal, while for others it's recreational. The reality is were you to take the current criminal justice system and replace it with the laws that were on the books in 1979, you would have to release 80% of all inmates in the United States. The behaviors haven't changed, the laws have. The behaviors hasn't changed, the policing has. The behaviors haven't changed, the sentencing has. We overlook availability of drugs and police only certain communities to see where they are. We also overlook the victimization of young black males who are in our criminal justice system, for the reality is that the overwhelming majority of African American males who are in the criminal justice system were victims of crime, victims of abuse, prior to becoming so-called perpetrators. Dr. Richard Dudley, a forensic psychiatrist in New York, emphasizes that young men of color on death row have a 70% history of child abuse, sexual abuse. Common Justice, which does restorative justice in Brooklyn, put together a focus group of returning citizens, people who are coming home from prison, from Rikers Island in particular. Our narrative places them as perpetrators. They all did time. But in conversation with them, they failed to be able to identify themselves as victims or survivors of crime. The perpetrator narrative is so strong that they don't even see their own pain. They don't see how they've been hurt. They don't see themselves created in the image of God. When the focus group was asked, have any of you been a victim of crime? 100% of them said no. And then they were asked another series of questions. Have you ever been seriously hurt in a fight that you did not initiate? Nine out of 10 said yes. I'm not a victim of crime, but I've been beaten up. They were asked, have you ever been robbed or had something taken you by force? Nine out of 10 said yes. They were so tied into the perpetrator narrative that they could not see themselves as victims. Have you ever had your home burglarized or something taken from your house? Eight out of 10 said yes. And so they had not, they had not had the ability to see themselves in the American narrative and certainly the way that we in the church buy into the American narrative and perpetuate the systems of dehumanization, they don't see themselves in the church narrative as well. Daniel Surrett of the Common Justice Initiative says we must recast a persistent and pervasive narrative that overrepresents young adults, young men of color, as aggressors or criminals. My own mayor in Philadelphia, Mayor Michael Nutter, in his attempts to champion reducing crime in poor neighborhoods, perpetuated the narrative of young men of color as aggressors. After a triple homicide, Mayor Nutter called a press conference and he said, quote, if adults are going to run around shooting children, acting like animals and anal cavities, and he didn't say anal cavity, 
but you all know what one is. This is the mayor of the fifth largest city in America who went to Christian school. Act like animals and anal cavities. We will track you down and catch you like the dog you are. That's not helpful language. That's not redemptive language. It's reducing people to behaviors, sinful to be sure, but not the sum total of who they were created to be. In so doing, we violate the theological anthropology of the Christian tradition, which says that these are people created in the image of God. What is necessary is a reframing of who the men and women are who are in our criminal justice system and the ability to see them as fully human. If we see them as fully human, we would then treat them differently and have a different set of expectations for their rehabilitation rather than freezing their current identity in the moment of time and believing that this is all they can ever be. The second dimension of theological anthropology that the song calls forth is community. If anybody asks you who I am, assumes that there's somebody else who wants to know. If anybody asks you who I am, it assumes that there are people who want to make some type of connection and to relate to me in light of what my real identity is. Somebody wants to know. Jeffrey Brown, who has been doing this work for many years in Boston, went to Gordon College, the Wheaton of the East, <laughs> and gave a presentation on Matthew 25. Dr. Brown says that most people read Matthew 25 and its list by which Jesus judges the nations, visiting the sick, coming to see the prisoner, feeding the hungry, giving the thirsty water to drink. Most people look at that list and try to figure out which side they're on. Am I a sheep or am I a goat? Brown argues that there is a third group that we tend to overlook. And those were the listeners themselves, many of whom were sick, many of whom were poor, many of whom had been imprisoned. Reverend Brown says, if I'm a poor person subject to prison, subject to sickness because of the disparity in health care, subject to hunger because of lack of income, if I'm listening to that story, I'm not trying to figure out, am I a sheep or I'm a goat? What I'm hearing is hope. I'm hearing that somebody's coming for me. That if I'm sick, someone's going to visit me. That if I'm in prison, someone's going to see about me. Reverend Brown says those folks weren't trying to figure out whether they were righteous or not. They were finally coming to the realization that in spite of what they've been through, somebody's coming. Somebody wants to know. Somebody really wants to see what's going on. Our problem is that we violate the theological anthropology of community by not going to visit, by not writing letters, by being ashamed of our loved ones and friends, people we've grown up with who may be incarcerated. In fact, we've created this special thing called prison ministry so that if you get sick, your whole church comes to see about you. People call, people send cards, people send flowers. If you're sick, the whole church knows it's in the bulletin. If you're sick, the whole church prays. But if you get incarcerated, you get three volunteers from somebody else's church that haven't been through Dr. Swanson's training at IPM, the junior varsity, People who would never be allowed to preach in your church on Sunday morning. Reverend, I believe God's called me to preach. Okay, then I'm assigning you to the prison ministry. Go practice on the inmates. And if you do good with inmates, maybe we'll let you have real people. I remember during my time of incarceration, the sermons were horrible. In fact, being a seminary professor, I like to think of myself as an expert on bad sermons, because you hear a lot of people just starting out. 
But, but the, the stuff I heard when I was in jail was, 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 was hilarious. You know, one guy talked about, you know, when you're out on your fishing boat and feeling, quote, quiet with God. I'm like, my fishing boat, okay. <laughs> the best one was the guy who says, when you get up in the morning and look in the mirror, what do you see? And we said, nothing, this is jail, there are no mirrors here. <laughs> Study your context before you bring the word. There are no mirrors in prison. But as for connections with our home churches, and there were people from church, that, when I first got locked up, I'm not one of these people who had one of these experiences where they were out in the street and then they went to jail and they got saved and they came out a new person. I was a Christian before I went to jail. Christians do sin. Some of them are punishable by incarceration. And when I got to prison, I was ashamed of being a Christian in prison, and I was ashamed of being a former pastor who was in prison. And so I decided that I was going to go incognito. I had bought into the shame narrative. I never let anybody know my last name because it's unusual enough that if you knew I'd been a pastor, then you would have recognized me. And I didn't give anybody my first name, and so I, I had to have an, an, a nickname. So I became Doc. Since I had a doctor, I became Doc, which also was convenient because it meant that my uniform was monogrammed. <laughs> see, in prison, you wear, you wear these orange jumpsuits that see, say DOC, Department of Corrections. Okay, now, all right. <laughs> And so for the first few weeks, I was incognito until a young man walked by and saw me on my bunk and said, Pastor? I said, who wants to know? He told me his name. I said, I don't remember him. He said, I used to play drums in your choir. I said, I still don't remember you. And then he told me his mother's name. She had been on my staff. The reality was that before I finished my year at the George W. Hill Correctional Facility, I met five young men whose mothers I had pastored, two young men whose cousin I had pastored, and one young man whose wife I had counseled through her divorce from him. The church was already connected to them. It was not a matter of outreach to go see them. It was a matter of pastoral care. But we have so dehumanized the inmate population that the only way that we can engage them in most church cases is through outreach. They are objects of evangelism. But tell me, is it really outreach when it's your brother? Is it really outreach when it's your grandfather, your grandmother? Is it really outreach when it's someone you grew up with? Or is it the reclamation of a relationship that has been marred by crime and incarceration? We have to change the language, and the only way to change the language is to change the theology. A theological anthropology that affirms community and connectedness as the context within which we develop our personhood will not allow us to throw away people to the criminal justice system just because they've made a mistake. They're still our brothers. They're still our cousins. They're still our nephews. They're still our parents. That has not changed. But if we buy the narrative that dehumanizes and lose sight of the theological anthropology that connects, then we lose them, and they are no longer part of the narrative. <coughs> and so in redefining inmates as connected to the church, as opposed to objects of outreach by the church, we actually reframe the whole notion of missions. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus says, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And prison, for most of us, is the uttermost part of the earth. But if your brother is in prison, it's Jerusalem. If your mother is in prison, it's Jerusalem. It's not the uttermost parts of the earth. Interestingly, this theological anthropology affirmation of community and human development actually fits the best of criminological research on prisoner reentry. Most of us have heard that a person coming home from prison, 
above all else, needs a job, because without employment, they can't make it. The truth of the matter is that getting a job is actually fourth on the list of criminogenic needs that reduce recidivism. At the top of the list is a change of attitude. A person who is incarcerated needs to make certain changes about how she or he views the world. In the Christian tradition, we call that conversion. Secondly, as part of that new way of looking at the world, they need a new way of making decisions. Criminologists talk about something called impulsivity, making decisions without considering the consequences of one's actions. Most people who are incarcerated did not think through to the consequence of, their, of the actions of their behavior and were incarcerated as a result of not recognizing the dangers of having been so. Dealing with impulsivity, or what we in the Christian church refer to as developing discipleship and discipline, is one of the key factors in reducing recidivism rates among the incarcerated. And the third critical component, third criminal, uh, criminogenic need, is developing a new social network. New friends, new people, people who care about you, people who share your values. You can ask the other way. If you give a person coming home from prison a job and a place to stay, but they don't change the way they think, they don't change their social network, they don't change the decision-making process, they can, lose those, they can lose the job and the house as well. So if attitudes, decision-making, and social network, the communal dimension of theological anthropology, are the critical criminogenic needs that reduce recidivism, what institution is there in your community that embodies those three as central to their core mission? If in changing minds, changing decision-making, and changing friendship networks, we give an inmate the best chance of doing well when she or he comes home, what institution to whom we should turn that majors in those three things? Can you think of one? I can. Of course, it's congregations. See, the truth of the matter is, if in your church, people aren't changing minds, changing decision-making processes, and changing social networks, your church doesn't have a criminal justice problem or a reentry problem, you have a church problem. Because that's the core of what you're supposed to be anyway. The sociological data is clear. The church is the most effectively poised institution in the community to reduce recidivism. Not job training, not housing programs, but institutions that change minds, decision-making, and social networks. But we will never get there as long as we continue to dehumanize men and women who come through the system. We will not get there as long as we buy into the narrative that excludes young black males who are disproportionately incarcerated by the system from being part of the human family and the American imagination. I was gonna say the American dream, but I got Imagination from Dr. Baycoat. I like that better, so we just change that. So if we then make this shift, then how does that impact policy? If we do make the shift in theological anthropology at the level of service, which is what we've been talking about up to this point, ministering to those who are incarcerated, ministering to those who are coming home, understanding their humanity and connecting with them. How does that translate into policy? C. Wright Mills, almost 100 years ago, sociologist, argued that all public issues are the amalgam of personal trials. All public issues are the amalgam of personal trials. That when one collects enough examples of personal trials and discovers the common theme and the common thread that runs through those trials. One discovers that you don't have just a bunch of personal trials, but you have a public issue. Surfacing 
the myriad public personal trials of men and women impacted by incarceration becomes the key strategy to begin to think about policy. Martin Luther King used to put it this way, if you were to go to a river and see somebody drowning as they floated downstream and pulled them out, and just as you got them to the shore, you saw another person drowning as they floated downstream and you pulled them out, and just as you got them out, you saw another person floating downstream and drowning and you got them out, eventually you'd need to go upstream and find out why so many people are falling in the river. The personal trial of dealing with the incarceration of a loved one gets hidden by shame and stigma. But when we surface the personal trials, like we did this morning in chapel, that's one of the reasons we did what we did this morning in chapel, have folks stand up. So now it's not an issue. There's 50 people here at Wheaton that have somebody locked up in their family. So what are you going to do? It's not an issue anymore. 50 people you go to class with, 50 people you know, not even including what happened on Monday, people you know. So you're already connected. So with that many folk in one place, there's some policy things that we're going to discover, policy issues that we're going to run into as a result of sharing the stories and amalgamating the narratives. Church people actually do not mobilize around issues. They mobilize around trials. They mobilize around people. One of the reasons that the church has been ineffective in dealing with reforming mass incarceration policy is that church people are bad at policy from the beginning. It wasn't always that way. There was a time when the church had a major voice in criminal justice policy. In fact, the first major reformation of criminal justice policy was initiated by Christians. Criminal justice policy at the infancy of this nation was based on punishment until a group of Christians in southeastern Pennsylvania got together and began to think about prison as a place of transformation. They created a, a, a penal institution where repentance was the primary goal. They gave it a special name. You've heard of it. It's called a penitentiary. We invented those. The thinking was that if you put a person in a small room, and gave them a Bible, and limited their human contact, that they would repent they would, they would reflect on their life, repent of their ways, and be transformed. What we discovered is that if you put a person in a small room and give them a Bible and limit them to human contact, is that folk go crazy. But we did at least plant the seeds of prison as a place of transformation. That was a first in human history. That evolved into the philosophy of rehabilitation, which created the kind of prison that we call the House of Corrections, that's where that comes from. All of which went down the drain when the war on drugs, revert, re, revere, when the war on drugs reverted the primary purpose of incarceration to punishment again. And we know that punishment does not work. Punishment is not an effective deterrent to behavior. There are three things that must be in place in order for punishment to work. It has to be consistent, it has to be swift, and it has to be severe. Punishment in our country is not consistent. If it were, most of you'd be locked up. Because consistent simply means every time you do something wrong, you have the consequence. Everyone in here has broken the law at some point, but you didn't get caught. So punishment can't be consistent. Punishment is consistent when you put your hand on a stove. Every time you put your hand on a stove, there are bad consequences. And so after you do it once, you don't do it again. It's a deterrent. It's consistent. But if I can get away with it once, I figure I can get away with it again. So incarceration as punishment is not effective because it's not consistent. Secondly, it's not swift we have a thing here called due process. And therefore, everyone is theoretically innocent until proven guilty. I, I, I know what's wrong with that statement, but, even, but just from a theoretical standpoint, because we have due process, it's not swift. You don't get locked up as soon as you do something. There is a time gap between the behavior and the incarceration. 
And third, it must be severe. For some poor people, incarceration is not only, not only is not severe, but it's a step up in life. The phrase, three hots in a cot, refers to the certainty that the poor have that if they are arrested and incarcerated, at least they know they'll eat and be warm. I have a former student who is also a police officer in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. And he told us how every, every November there's a young man in their community that goes looking for the rookie cop because all of the other policemen know him. And once he finds a cop he doesn't know, he punches him in the face, knowing that he will be arrested and detained for at least 90 days, which translates from November through February, and he'll be released when it's warm. Three hots in a cot. In subcultures, where prison service is revered as street credibility, punishment is not severe. It's seen as a badge of honor. The reality is that the combination of consistent, swift, and severe will never exist in United States jurisprudence. So why expect it to be an effective deterrent to behavior? Yet that's where we've gone in the post-Nixon years. And just as the church was in a position to address the philosophy of incarceration and policy in the 1820s, so too are we in a position 200 years later to impact policy as we collect the stories of the men and women who are behind bars and what happens to them when they are warehoused. The average American makes 150 decisions every day. The average inmate makes 25. You have no choice over what you wear. You have no choice over what you eat. You have no choice over when you sleep. You have no choice over when you shower. In fact, having choice taken away in such a draconian method has led to severe mental health consequences for people on the way out. Many of you know the name Pat Nolan. Pat Nolan just stepped down as the director of Justice Fellowship, the public policy wing for a prison fellowship of Chuck Colson fame. Pat Nolan did two years federal time for campaign impropriety and financial irregularity as a state legislature in California. When he came out, he was taken to dinner, and this is taken from a testimony that he gave before Congress on criminal justice before. When he was taken to dinner by some friends, they handed him a menu, and he suffered a panic anxiety attack. It had been two years, says Pat, since I had a choice of what I could eat. Having those kinds of choices overwhelm me, and my friends had to surround me and keep me from passing out. If I went through that as a middle-class white male, educated and well-supported, how much more does someone who is poor a person of color, someone without the support systems that I have, go through in making the transition back home. Not just in terms of getting a job, not just in terms of getting housing, but on having the kind of mental health support systems in place. And how much more we need to reform the system so it doesn't create that in the first place. I remember one of the things I did in jail for the first time in years was I read a novel. And it was a novel um, about this girl and the tattoo. Y'all know it. Y'all know it. Girl with the dragon tattoo? Yes, girl with the dragon tattoo. In the opening chapter, the protagonist is in jail. And I'm, I'm reading it. And he's working on his laptop. And I stopped. I'm in jail. He's in jail. He has a laptop. I got a pencil. And that didn't make any sense to me. I said, until I discovered through work with the, with the Vera Institute of Justice that in many prisons in Sweden and Holland and Germany, inmates are treated like human beings. They keep their laptops. They wear their own clothes. They don't wear uniforms. Women who give birth in prison are not shackled when the child is born. You know that 17 states in the United States still do that. That when a woman gives birth in prison, she's shackled to the bed. 
and in most cases, once she gives birth, the baby is taken away, whereas in Europe, they're able to keep the baby for up to two years so they can bond during the critical periods. Corrections officers in Europe do two years of intensified training equivalent to the Master of Social Work so they can treat inmates like human beings. Corrections officers in the United States go through 90 days of paramilitary training so they can be the zookeepers they've been trained to be. When we collect the stories and recognize how many people go through that and that they are people that we know, we are then in a position to advocate for change in how we incarcerate people, in how we, I'm sorry, in how we incarcerate people, and in whether or not incarceration is the proper method of address for their behavior. Identifying policies becomes easier when you hear the stories. Policies around how people are treated while they're in prison, policies around whether or not prison programs are actually effective, and policies about what kinds of supports we need for people making the transition back home. One of the interesting things we are discovering is that there is basically no correlation between social programs that correct people's behavior in prison and how well they do when they come home. The reality is that most programs are as effective as the staff who administer them. Bad programs work when good staff run them. Good programs don't work when bad staff run them. And so the question becomes, how do we choose the people to work in our prisons? The fact of the matter is that most people who work in prisons don't want to be there. How do we incentivize prison staff positions so that they attract people that actually want to cha change things and make a difference, rather than getting corrections officers who flunked the police exam, prison chaplains who couldn't get a church, and social workers for whom this was the only job that they could get that was give them a steady income. I talked to prison staff all over the country. I have yet to meet someone who said, I, when I was young, I, I, when, I, when I was young, this is what I wanted to do when I grew up. How do we change policies that ensure that we have solid programming? Part of that is that we understand that the people that are incarcerated are people. That's back to theological anthropology. They are people deserving of our care. They are people deserving our, of our support. If they have drug and alcohol issues, they need treatment. And if they have issues with violence, they need conflict resolution skills. Because most violent behavior is cyclical. And in the words of the Chicago, um, uh, in the words of the, of the Chicago epidemiologist who created Operation Ceasefire, it, is, it, it functions like an, um, an epidemic. And then lastly, if we take theological anthropology seriously, then we also recognize that people who are coming home not only need a second chance, but need the relationships of support that are necessary for them to become productive. It's not just a job, it's a social network that will be there for them through the period of transition. I remember a rather humorous story of a young man who came home and his issue wasn't jobs, his issue wasn't housing, his issue was how the world had changed. And there was no one to walk with him through a world that he didn't recognize. He didn't know a world with cell phones. He didn't know a world where you swiped a card to get on the bus. He didn't know a world where the toilet flushes when you stand up. In fact, he said, I went to Union Station to use the toilet, and when I stood up, the toilet flushed, and I turned around, because I was going to knock somebody out. He said, I finally calmed down until I went over to the sink, and when I put my hands over, the sink came on, so I just left the train station. He doesn't need a program. He needs fellowship. We're so busy creating programs for people that we lose sight of the fact that they simply need someone to walk with them. People say, I'm not called to prison ministry. I'm not asking you to go in. You may just be called to walk with somebody, 
making the transition back home. You don't have to find them a job, but you can go with them to the job interview and commiserate with them if they don't get it. That's prison ministry. We've got to come to the point where we take prison ministry beyond the outreach, objectifying, dehumanizing, going in and bringing the gospel, the Bible and a tambourine, standing outside in the parking lot, deciding who's going to do the song, who's going to do the prayer, and develop a more fully orbed response to the human suffering that incarceration causes. You can do prison ministry without ever setting foot in the prison just by walking with a prisoner when she or he comes home and helping them understand how the bus system works, helping them understand that, no, the toilet's flushed by themselves now. Or you can walk with one young man from Baltimore to the corner store because it took him an hour to get home. You see, when he got to the corner store, he stood in front of it waiting for the door to open because he had not opened a door in 20 years. You don't open your own doors in jail or in prison. And finally, after about 15 minutes, he realized, oh, I'm home. I can open the door myself. And he walked up and opened the door and went into the store. You can go to the store with him. That's prison ministry. It's ministry that recognizes his humanity and then calls on our society to provide greater supports to make the transition better. Issues such as alternative sentencing, keeping, keeping people out of the system, drug courts where people get treatment and not incarceration. Issues like collateral sanctions, whether or not a person can vote when they come home, whether or not a person has access to uh, educational grants, whether or not a person has to fill out on their, app, uh, uh, check a box on their employment application that indicates that they may have had a felony conviction or an arrest. These types of sanctions are a matter of policy, and the reason we are not outraged by them is that we have not surfaced enough of the stories of personal trials in order to create the public issue. But these are men and women created in the image of God. They were, di they were worth dying for. They were bought with a, cry a price. If anybody asks you who they are, who do you say they are? Do you say they are created in the image of God? Do you say they are deserving of human community by virtue of being created in the image of God? Our theological anthropology controls the way in which we frame our outreach to the prisons and the way in which we craft policies for those who have been found in violation of the law. Our theological anthropology creates an alternative narrative to the dehumanizing narrative created by American society and into which we've bought as a church rather than criticize from a prophetic perspective. What do you see? What you see very often determines how you respond. Howard Thurman, the Christian philosopher, was raised in a segregated society in Florida, in Daytona Beach. There was one white family that could not escape from the neighborhood. They were poor. And so there were all of these black families and this one white family that lived next to the Thurmans. When the, Thurman, when the, when the white people looked next door, they saw a, a degraded people. They did not like the Thurmans. They would not speak to them. When the Thurmans looked at the white family next door, they saw people created in the image of God. One day, the matriarch of the white family decided that she and her family would punish the Thurmans simply because they were black. She sent her son out back where the chickens were. She said, I want you to take a spatula and scrape all of the manure off of the floor of the chicken coop and dump it in the Thurmans' backyard so they'll know what we think of them. She did. He did. Sometime later, the woman became ill. Grandma Thurman, being the Christian that she was, decided to care for her and took her a bowl of chicken soup and some roses from her garden. Her protagonist thanked her and said, the soup is good and the roses are beautiful. She said, thank you very much. How did you get them to grow so red and full? 
And how did you get the stems to grow so long and green? Grandma Thurman said, well, you remember that chicken manure you dumped in my backyard? You saw that as manure, but I saw it as fertilizer. And because I looked at the same thing that you did in a different manner, I'm able to bring back a blessing to you. When you look at the inmate, what do you see? Do you see manure? Do you see waste? Or do you see fertilizer? Potential? Growth? If anybody asks you who they are, what will you tell them? God bless you. So we have some time for questions and comments. Okay, one, two. Good. Uh, you mentioned so that Mitch Michael Nutter, uh, and that made me think about Wilson Good. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was this. Uh, He's my board chair, so be careful. Oh, this would be perfect then. Okay. I, I'm, 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 I was getting hot toward the end. Oh, no? yeah. <laughs> Well, because I've got on outside clothes underneath. Oh, right, right. So, so uh, most of good associated with a certain mm -hmm. building well, you can say. explosion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering about what was the reasoning that went to that. I mean, it was not true. So, mm -hmm. um, because we were talking about the here's on the Yeah. In that situation. Um, what was the, the kind of language that, that Wilson used? I mean, I don't remember. Okay, May 13th, 1985. Um, in Philadelphia, Wilson Good was the mayor of Philadelphia, and we had a group in, um, in Philadelphia called MOVE that was back to nature, very much um, uh, anti-capitalist, anti-American. Um, and they had taken up residence in the, in the neighborhood, and there was a lot of conflict between them and the neighborhood, conflict between them and the police. And so um, it was discovered that they had a, an arsenal on the roof of their home. And the chief of police, um, Gregor Sanborn, went to the mayor and said, my advice is to let me drop an incendiary device on the arsenal to blow that up because it's a danger. What it did was it caught fire and it burned down three blocks of houses. People were killed. Um, many people were displaced. I think one or two people were killed, but many people were displaced. And Wilson Good has been excoriated ever since as being the mayor who dropped a bomb on his own people. So that's, that's what he's referring to. I can say several things about that. And again, in, in, by, you know, in, in, in the name of full disclosure, Wilson Good is my board chair, but he's also my former student. Um, in fact, he was in the same class. Um, the young man that was on the, uh, on the podium with us today that did the prayer, um, his pastor and Wilson Good were classmates in, in, in graduate school in my class. So, number one, Wilson Good drew the wrath of a number of people when he said, they said, if you had to do it all over again, would you have done the same thing? He said, yes, because I would have had the same information. He's very sorry about the loss of life. He wished it had never happened. There are people who've never forgiven him for it. He was my friend when I was arrested and incarcerated, and he came up to me the week before I went to jail. And he says, I had a life before May 13th, 1985. I did a lot of good things. He said, I've had a life after May 13th, 1985, and I've done a lot of good things. He said, I'm sorry for what happened on that day, but I refuse to let it define who I am. You're getting ready to go to prison. Don't let that define who you are. You had a life before and you'll have a life after, and God will use you while you're there. So what he has done is he has taken the lessons of a mistake and turned it into something positive. It was, it was how he could support me through my entire case. 
because he's been, he's been excoriated publicly. There are people that still haven't forgiven him for that. There are people that won't work with him. There are people, he's, he's since that day, he, he, he's become an ordained minister. He's been to seminary. He has started um, the nation's largest faith-based program for adopting children of prisoners. He's been responsible for training over 100,000 men and women of faith to become big brothers and big sisters to children who have an incarcerated mother or father. But everybody wants to talk about that one day, for which he is remorseful, but he also realized that after the mistake, he had to move on. It's a, it's a, it's a good model. Now, one of the reasons that Wilson Good started this program for children of the incarcerated Getting, ch getting ch church people into their lives. Because see, that's another place you can do prison ministry without going into prison. Become a big brother or big sister to a child who has an incarcerated parent. The program's called Amachi. A-M-A-C-H-I, Amachi. And there are other programs that do the same thing. But when Wilson Good was a teenager, his father was arrested and incarcerated. His father had a history of, of, of alcoholism and violent behavior. He got locked up, Wilson's mother packed up the kids, and they moved them from a tobacco farm, they were sharecroppers in Seaboard, North Carolina, to a working class neighborhood in Philadelphia. Went to John Bartram High School, where the guidance counselor told him he was not college material. And so he got a job working in a tobacco plant. So they moved 500 miles to go from picking the tobacco to canning it. His pastor came up to him and said, why aren't you going to college? He said, my guidance counselor said, I'm not college material. See, that's that narrative in which young black males don't get to participate. Because Bartram at the time was a predominantly white school and it was just a little small number of black kids that were there whose parents worked in the factories. And most of them were, were shuttled into vocational uh, training rather than um, um, college prep. So Wilson was just another black kid that they didn't think could think. He stuttered, that made it worse. And so the pastor said, that's nonsense, your, co your college material. And so the church took up an offering to send him to college. His, the pastor's wife called Morgan State College, now Morgan State University in Baltimore, and said, we've got a young man that we want to send down there to you. And so because of his church, this child of an incarcerated parent ended up going to college then doing his master's at the Wharton School, becoming city manager, and then the first black mayor of Philadelphia. And now he's created a program that has trained tens of thousands of adults to intervene in the lives of children of prisoners and reduce the risk that they too become part of the system. But all anybody wants to talk about is May 13th, 1985. Doesn't make it right, but it's another story of redemption. So um, I, I, have, I have nothing but respect for, for Dr. Good. Um, and um, I appreciate that when, when, when he leaves this planet, there will be more people who will think of him as the one who authorized the bombing than of somebody who probably saved thousands of lives of kids who were headed into the system because the single most accurate predictor of whether or not a young person ends up in the system is not their race, not their gender, not their economic status, is whether or not they have a parent who's in prison. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Julia, first of all, thank you for, for coming. I, I listened to you for the first time last May at the CMCA summit here, and uh, it was awesome as well, so thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm also a student of Dr. Swanson's. And um, I wanted to ask you about the stigma, because it seems like there's even a, uh, a, a lower stigma, if there's such a thing, for those who are coming home who uh, are sex offenders. Mm -hmm. And say, for example, if, if you're trying to uh, start a ministry program at your church, and someone asks you that, and it seems like there's a, a greater concern because they have children at the church and things like that. How would you handle something like that? Well, there is um, a ch child advocacy group in the UK 
that has written a primer on how to protect children in the church when you have a sex offender ministry. And the reason that I use that for our training purposes is that their emphasis is not on the love for the offender. Basically what they're saying is, well, if you're going to do this, then you, this is how you, what you have to do to protect the children. So it's very, very weighted in that direction. And that's fine because you have to protect the children. Now, one of the critical components for recidivism reduction that I mentioned was a change in attitude and a change in decision-making process. A large part of that is what we call taking responsibility for what we did. So that if a person is not willing to take responsibility for what they've done, the chances of change are very, very limited. We, we, hey, that's, that's Christian. You know, you got to repent and be baptized, right? You know, not, not, there, there aren't a whole lot of people in the Bible who just, you know, you know, like, like Paul, you know, Paul didn't have a chance to repent at first. He just got, he just got saved from, I want you, you know, right? Um, but, you know, normally it's repent and be baptized. So we teach that anyway, right? Taking responsibility. What does repent mean? I am a sinner, right? You, whether, whether, however you said it. If you were in a youth group and we all said, you know, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you know, whatever we did, you had to at some point say, I'm a sinner. So, so that's called accountability. If I'm a sex offender, I have to be willing to be accountable. And part of accountability means that I have to circumscribe my walk in public on behalf of my brothers and sisters. There's still consequences. So if you have a sex offender ministry, one of the things is they're, they're never alone in the church. You know, um, you know, somebody from the sex offender ministry walks them to the bathroom. They don't go anywhere by themselves. And somebody may say, well, that's offensive to me as a sex. No, no. If I know what I did, then I know why I've got to do this. It's taking responsibility. Somebody who doesn't take, you know, well, I couldn't help myself. No, you could. You can help yourself. You may be attracted to the wrong person. I'm an alcoholic. Okay, I am attracted to alcohol. I just can't drink. Well, I don't drink. I can drink. Now, you don't want to see me drunk. Promise. But it's, it's my, re, my accountability is don't drink. So I go to a ball game, and everybody's got a beer. I can't have a beer. I can, but then my allergy takes over because I'm allergic to alcohol. When I drink, I break out in handcuffs. <laughs> okay? So, you know, so I can be attracted to something, but I have to, I have to, I have to guard my behavior. Certain places I don't go, not because I can't go, but because my accountability system, you know, I can't have a, I can't, I can't sit at the bar with you and drink a Coke while you drink a beer. I can't do that. I know people who can. You know, not me. Not today. Maybe down the road. Sometimes I won't go to a ball game. Because it's not, it's not a good day to go to a ball game. That's my accountability. Is going to a ball game sin? No. But I can't go. So, um, or, you know, I may go with some AA buddies, something like that. Or I may go with someone I'm discipling and who I would never drink in front of in the first place. Right? So the key to having a sex offender ministry is making sure that the children are protected and making sure that the people in the ministry are willing to be accountable. And if they're not, if they're not willing to be accountable, then... There's a difference between cutting someone loose and giving up on someone. You can cut somebody loose without giving up on them. You can keep praying for them. If I, if I, if I tell you you can't come back to this church, that doesn't mean I gave up on you. But for, for, for now, we gotta cut the tie. That may be that may be the catalyst in their in their restoration.
what I tell churches all the time, because there's so many times when you do this and the person fails and fails and fails, I say, well, when do you give up on them? I say, you never give up on them, but there's some times where you've got to cut them loose. Other comments, questions? Yes. Um, Father, I appreciated your um, emphasis on the image of God aspect of theological anthropology, and this is just a comment. My sister is um, an OBGYN, and when she was in her residency, um, she would deliver babies at the university hospital, and that's where inmates would go. And um, she said the thing that struck her the most throughout her whole medical school residency was the fact that when she delivered um, her first baby from um, a woman who was incarcerated and actually was not shackled, well, she said the first time she touched her in an exam, the woman just burst into tears. And she said she thought, she said, did I hurt you? And the woman said no. Um, she just shook her head and then she realized that she just hadn't been touched. Um, mm -hmm. So also seeing people, I mean, it's, um, significant because in the Gospels, Jesus not only saw people, he touched people. Mm -hmm. um, and that touch, just her touch, um, just changed that himself. Yeah. In his book on prison ministry culture, Lenny Spitali talks about the number of fights in prisons that occur not because people are violent but because it's the only way you can touch another human being. Because you don't touch in prison. So, and, and, and we were built to touch. So if I can't hug you, if I can't put my arm around you, I punch you in the face. At least that's the way I can touch you. When we started our prison ministry, and when I say our prison ministry, I'm talking about the inmates on my block because the chaplain that was there when I first got there never came on our block. And then he was replaced by another chaplain who knew me. And we were having this conversation at lunch. Because she knew me, they had this thing called uh, no fraternization rule, which meant that she couldn't come on my block to minister to people on my block because she knew me. So she found out I was on the block. She had to call the ward and say, I know, I know 1000-2648. And um, at that, that, that moment, we, we lost the chaplain. They, and so we had to start our own church services. And one of the things that we decided to do was at the end of every service to put our arms around each other and sing. Because we knew that there was no other place where we could do that. And we wanted to kind of keep it nonviolent and also you know, two men can touch each other and there not be something wrong with it in a prison environment. And so we put our arms around each other at the end of every service and we sang This Little Light of Mine. And the reason we sang This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to let it shine, was to remind ourselves of our responsibility as Christians inside the system to be agents of change. We didn't need the church to bring us the gospel. Right? We're bringing the gospel into the prison. Shut up. It's already there. We're taking Jesus to the jail. He beat you, tiger. <laughs> you ain't taking him nowhere. He ain't been. See, that's that imperialist, um, evangelistic, um, dehumanizing. We have to take Jesus behind. No, 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 no. No, he's already there. And so this little light of mine was also a critique of Christians who would bring the gospel in. It reminded us that the gospel was there, not just when they showed up on Sunday for the service, but that he was always there. And, and we could call on him on Wednesday when the church wasn't around, or at least the institutional church was around. The church was around because we were the church. Yeah. You used... Uh the word fellowship or to fellowship with one another. Can you expound a little bit more on just what the depth of that, what that really means? And then my second question really is uh, capitalism, capital, financing. How do you make a change when our society is kind of built on 
paying for something. Okay. One of the things that one of the things that the proponents of punishment don't want is fellowship. They want you isolated. They're afraid that if you come together, you can form enough of a power block to make things change. That's one of the reasons that the powers that be like the current system of prison ministry where a different church comes in every week because they never build relationships. Um, they don't get to know inmates, they don't get to talk with inmates and the inmates just come together to worship and then they, they disperse and any bonding that they may do as Christian brothers and, or Christian sisters, they do on their own. There's nobody helping them with it. Along came a guy named William Barrett who was the chaplain at the Rahway State Prison in New Jersey. And he said, there's something wrong with this. He said, for a church to be a church, there's gotta be fellowship. And so he organized the inmates in Rahway into the Reconciliation Baptist Church of New Jersey. He had them incorporated. He got them into the Progressive National Baptist Convention. And he discipled one of the inmates who felt he had a call um, into the position of assistant pastor and then eventually pastor. So that Chaplain Barrett was the chaplain responsible for everybody's religious services, but Marcus was the pastor of Reconciliation Baptist Church. And they voted, they tithed, um, all kinds of stuff. And the warden hated it because he understood that these guys now were gaining a sense of, of, of their power. And so he went over the books until he found something he could charge Barrett with and had him fired. But, 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 but remember he said this morning that, that, that it's not the Polaroid, it's the DVD. The Lutherans picked up on the idea and they planted the church in the Jessup Correctional Facility in Maryland. The Episcopalians planted the church at Greaterford Maximum Security Prison in Pennsylvania. The United Methodists planted churches in the Iowa Women's Correctional Institution and the Tennessee. These are churches. These are churches. Women at the Well United Methodist Church is inside the Iowa Correctional Facility. Their pastor is not the chaplain. Their pastor is a United Methodist member of the annual conference who was appointed to be the pastor and reports back to the bishop. In Oklahoma, I was there to visit, oh, I wish I could think of the name of the prison. It's not too far from Oklahoma, so if you say it, I'll know it. It begins with a G. Right. No, that's not it. Ah. Now, if I hear it, I'll know it. But at any rate, I go into the prison, and they say the pastor will be here any minute. So I'm looking, I'm waiting. I'm, I don't know who the pastor was. You know, I thought they met the chaplain. Maybe it was an outside pastor doing missionary work. All this is fellowship. Remember the context is fellowship. Pastor, so finally someone says, the pastor's here. So I'm like, where? And then this little white guy in an orange jumpsuit says, I'm Pastor Brown. <laughs> I said, oh. Then I'm thinking, oh, maybe he's like me. He was a pastor before he got in and you know, yada, 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 yada. You know, so I'm wondering what he did, you know. <laughs> so... <laughs> He goes on to explain to me that he was doing life for murder, that he had been a biker, he got saved in prison, and that the chaplain understood his role, the chaplain's role, as an apostolic ministry. And as an apostle, his job was not to pastor the inmates, but to plant a church amongst the indigenous population, then raise up indigenous leadership. So that his role as the chaplain was to be like a bishop because he was sent from the outside. He didn't live there. And so he, he discipled these men until some became deacons and some became elders. And then he called a group of pastors in, had an ordination council and ordained several people to be the pastors 
of the church inside the prison. Part of what we've got to call for within the prison context is places of fellowship, where, where, where people are able to talk to each other, where people are able to bear their souls without seeming to be a punk. You have to, one of my roles in the facility where I was, and it was minimum security. I wasn't in there with any violent offenders. I was in there mostly with people with, with drug offenses, frauds and, 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 and drunk driving, a whole bunch of stuff like that. But most of the guys I was in with, by the time I left, I was the guy they would call over to their bed and say, I need to talk to you. And then they would sit with their face facing the wall because they didn't want anybody to see them cry. And then one young man was telling me that he just got off the phone with his baby mama and not only did she leave him, she's moved in with another guy and she's teaching their kids to call him daddy. So he just needed to talk to somebody. We had created the kind of space through the church and through other things we did where he knew there was someone he could talk to and there's someone who wouldn't look down on him. And I had more than one case where young white guys, some a couple of older white guys, black guys too, would just come over and say, Doc, can we talk? Or I remember um, we had this one guy, Bud. Bud was a lapsed Catholic drunk, ended up going upstate and then coming back and having to do county time that he owed before he went upstate. So everybody called Bud Upstate. <laughs> but he had rediscovered his Catholic faith when he was upstate, right? So um, we used to rotate the preaching. So upstate was getting ready to preach um, the next day. And the, the rule was you had to bring the sermon by Doc so he could check it for biblical accuracy, right? So upstate brings me the sermon. And we go over it, and it's a great sermon. It's a great, it's, it's, it, it was on Hebrews 13. Seeing as we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that us so easily beset us and fixing our eyes upon Jesus, um, let us run with patience, uh, you know, fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. Who for the, who for the, who for the uh, pain that was, what was it? Who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Thank you. And he had put this sermon together, right? He said, and he says um, that Jesus, this is written about Jesus' incarceration. He's in custody just like us. And how did he handle it? He laid aside every weight. He laid aside the sin that so he beset us. He despised the shame. There's so much shame that goes with us being here. But Jesus despised the shame for the joy that was set before him. He would not allow himself to be consumed by the shame. Brilliant sermon, right? Ten times better than any of the volunteers, um, <laughs> except for Lenny. So just before um, lights out that Saturday night, uh, Upstate was also in charge of the cleaning materials, and he needed some cleaning materials, and the guard who was on duty wouldn't give him any. And Bud's temper just exploded, and he just went all off on the guy, and really laid him out. So he comes back to the queue. I'm like, yo, Bud, how are you going to preach that sermon tomorrow with what you just did? But see, we had built that kind of a, we had built that kind of a fellowship. He says, Doc, you're right. You're right, I gotta apologize. Well, we, the, the, in, the, the guard, we called him Fi Fi. I don't know why, where that came from. He said, I'll go apologize to Fi Fi. And he said, and I gotta do it in front of everybody because I, I cussed him out in front of everybody. I said, yeah. So he did. He went back. Fellowship is not just getting along, it's, it's true fellowship. You can create that. But it's hard to do when the system works against it. And you've got to, you've got to in your visits, in your, when, when people go to minister, they can't just see, what happens is people come in to minister and they just want to get people saved. They want to go home and talk about how they got saved. You've got to disciple people and give them things that they can do in between on those Sundays so that they know how to build the fellowship. Mm -hmm. And you need to get chaplains in there that are not just people that couldn't get a church and so this is a steady job. You've got to agitate, you've got to agitate, you know, some, some places the chaplain's job is not a paid position. Some, some jails don't have chaplains. You get a chaplain, if somebody else pays for it, we'll have a chaplain. 
or if somebody volunteers, he can be the chaplain. But we're not going to we're not going to we're not going to pay somebody to do full time ministry in, in, in a county jail. So that's the fellowship piece. It can be created. The money piece, I assume you're referring to for profit prisons and people who make money off of incarceration. No, I'm really talking about in terms of capital. Who's willing to pay for you know to make the transition to, to do the things that you know? If I'm a politician, I'm not going to say I'm going to start putting money in X, Y, and Z location for improvements. Just like in, with with something a little different. When we had in Louisiana, New Orleans, the Katrina, mm -hmm. they talked about the levees. What politician want to say let's spend money on building the infrastructure? The levees. Got it. Here's, here's, here, here's, here's how that plays. This is, real, this is real simple, somewhat slick, and a perfect storm. We are at, we, we got a window right now. We got a window where both sides of the aisle know the system is broken. Democrats are saying our prisons are inhumane. Republicans are saying our prisons cost too much. And so there is this meeting in, in, in Washington where, 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 where they're not agreeing on anything else. They agree on this. Some of the most progressive reforms in prison policy have come in states controlled by Republican governors because it costs too much. And so there's actually a website out of Texas called Right on Crime, and that's a play on words. They want to get things right, and we are the political right. Okay, these are conservatives who are, who are so we've got this storm. One of the issues is that you've got to show the folks on the right how much money you can save by investing in programming. Now, I'm, I'm literally, I'm working on this as we speak with the state of Pennsylvania. We have a program that'll cost us $2 million up front to put it in place, but we can, we can save $10 million over five years. But we got, someone's got to spend the $2 million up front. And so we are partnering with another agency to bring this program that will provide social support networks and mental health to men and women who are incarcerated in the state of Pennsylvania. Now, how many of you have heard something to the effect that, that it costs $40,000 to lock a person up, right? You've heard that? Don't drink that Kool-Aid, right? <laughs> because that's deceptive. I'm going to help you. When I say that it costs $40,000 to lock a person up for a year, I'm creating the impression that if I reduce the prison population by one person, I save the government $40,000. Well, I don't, because if I take one person out of the system, still need the same amount of lights, the same amount of corrections officers, the same amount of classroom space. It's not about getting one person out. I got to show how I can close down a unit how I can close down a whole cell block, how I can close down a whole jail. So the proposal that we're making to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is to provide services that in one year will take 220 people out of prison, and that's one cell block you can close. Because by providing mental health services through federal entitlement programs, which is what our partner does, and social support networks through congregations, which is what we do, there are 220 people that are currently in the Pennsylvania prison system who are being kept there because they don't have access to mental health services. But they are entitled to SSI, SSDI, other, other, other programs. By virtue of being American citizens, they just never registered. We've got the software that we can get them into the system. And then they can collect their Social Security. They can get their veterans' benefits and then we can provide support through the congregations and you don't have to keep them locked up because that's the only place that they're going to take their meds. And if we close down a unit the first year, two units the second year, that's 220 times $40,000. Now you're talking about saving the government a million dollars. So the investment makes mathematical sense. Where, there's a, where there are problems, 
is in corrections officer unions. You know what the starting salary is for a SEAL in California? 60000 It's a starting salary. What are you doing here in Wheaton? Move to California, <laughs> become a CO. You'll make more money than anybody in there in the first year out of Wheaton now. So no, they don't want to close any prisons. They were going to close a prison in Camden because uh, the newest state prison we had in New Jersey, they wanted to close it down because it's on the waterfront. I mean, it was, it was only 10 years old. And then somebody said, you know, we never should have built this prison on the waterfront. This is prime property. So they said, we'll tear it down. The corrections officers union put out these flyers with guys coming out of prison with machine guns and tanks and, <laughs> and knives and pirate patches, you know. You know. If we close Camden Prison, look what's going to happen. You know, it was the COs. It, it, was, it was the union. This, they were worried about losing jobs. You know. So, so the, 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 there are people that are making money off the system, <coughs> like corrections officers, like for-profit prison companies, which is what I thought he mentioned earlier. You, you know there are now companies that are publicly traded on the Wall Street that are for-profit corrections corporations. Anybody didn't know that? Okay. And they get paid for how many people they house. So it's to their advantage. They actually spend money to lobby for tougher laws because the more people that get locked up, they've spent $7 million, CCA, one company, Corrections Corporation of America spent $7 million over the last few years to lobby for tougher laws so there'd be more inmates for them to take care of and then get paid for. In fact, they actually offered the 48 governors of the continental United States $20 million to each state, just $20 million in the general operating. If you'll give us a 20-year contract to run your prisons with a guarantee of 90% capacity. And so a whole lot of us around the country wrote letters and calls to governors and saying, don't take the money, don't take the money. The incentive for the for-profit prison, the, the incentive for the for-profit prison, and this is what we're working on, some of us are working on, is to pay them based on recidivism rates. The more people that don't come back, the more successful you are, so therefore the more money you get. Instead of the counterfactual, the more people you have, the more money we pay you. Well, then, of course, then they want people. Why should I rehabilitate people if I get paid for them coming back here? Right. So, and, and we, we, Idaho, the Supreme Court just shut down a for-profit company in Idaho that was, um, Idaho has six state prisons one run by the for-profit company and the other five run by the state. And the one that had, was run by the for-profit company had more assaults in the prison than the other five combined. And the reason was because they are a for-profit company, they cut corners and they used fewer, fewer COs, fewer program people. Um, and where the, where the case went to the Supreme Court was that it was actually found out that they were having CEOs falsify their timesheets to making it look like they were there when they weren't, thereby reducing the safety because there were, so, there were not enough CEOs to provide adequate supervision around the facility. But if, if, I, if, if, if the more money, I, if the less money I spend on rehabilitation, the less money I spend on security, the more money we get to keep and distribute to shareholders, what's the incentive for people to get better? So the whole concept of, for, of a for-profit prison corporation is, 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 is offensive in my, in my judgment. So we're over time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.